Professor, ready to carry on? Yes. Good, thank you very much. Okay. Yes, thank you. Right, uh, I know you have some questions to put to me, so I'll try and keep this as brief as I can. Uh, I would like to really reassure you this is a somewhat shorter presentation than right. some of the ones this morning. Thank so, you. sorry. No, no, thank yep. you. So, um, in this one, I want to address the possible toxicity performance of materials present at the Grenfell Tower. And um, in doing this, I want to emphasize that, that the statements and cons um, calculations things, some of the numbers I'm presenting here, are intended purely to be sort of indicative of the possible conditions mm -hmm. that could be produced. And really what I'm trying to address here is essentially a sort of qualitative question, mm -hmm. which is taking <coughs> the, all these different individual materials, including the cladding, the insulation, the window structural materials and the contents, each of these individually or in combination, had they become involved in far outside, a, if you like, a, a, a typical or an example set, a two story, two uh, bedroom flat, could they have produced hazard, hazardous conditions in the flat and the lobby beyond? And then, particularly here, I'm looking at a sort of snapshot in time um, early in the fire, when the fire is breaking into flat six on every floor and then the, the smoke is going beyond into the lobby. And it's this sort of period up to around <coughs> 0130 hours when the lobby is filled with a dense irritant smoke that was so important in affecting the potential of escape for mm -hmm. people who remained in their flats at that time. So it's this kind of 130-ish period that's sort of in the back of my mind. So what is the contribution of any burning material to toxic hazards? Uh, Grenfell. This will depend on the, obviously, on the extent of their combustion products. Uh, the expense, sorry, the extent to which their combustion products form part of the time concentration curves for toxic smoke and gases inhaled by each <coughs> occupant at various locations and times in the tower. And and this depends upon the mass burning rate. How many kilograms of any particular fuel are consumed each second? <coughs> And then it depends on the yields of smoke and toxic products from those fuels when they burn. For example, how many kilograms of carbon monoxide is produced when each kilogram of material is burned. And then it depends on the volume into which those products are dispersed, such as the interior volume of an enclosed flat. And that gives us a term called mass loss concentration, kilograms per meter cubed. It's the number of products from that material dispersed, say, into the volume of this room. Now, what, what can, determines the yields of smoke and toxic gases from any burning material? Well, firstly, it depends upon the elemental composition of that material. How much carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, bromine, phosphorus, and possibly inert fillers this material is composed of. Secondly, it depends on some, to some extent on the organic composition. What kind of polymer is it? Something like polystyrene, for example, or polyisocyanurate. They behave differently in, in the way they behave. Polystyrene, for example, because of its aromatic composition, is, uh, produces very high yields of smoke particulates when it burns. And uh, flame retardant additives can also have a large effect on the type of combustion and the products that you get. But then thirdly, and very importantly, it depends on the combustion conditions, as I explained this morning. For flaming fires, it's the fuel-to-air equivalence ratio, whether it's well-ventilated or under-ventilated, that can have a big effect on the yields of toxic products. Now, for developing in hazards on, in a Grenfell flat, I've identified three main fuel, what I call fuel packages of interest. The first one is the combustible parts of the rain screen cladding and the insulation basically outside the flat. So that's the Rainer Bond, 
the Celotex panels on the spandrels and the panels on the columns. Secondly, you've got the combustible parts in the window surround and between the windows. So you've got the exterior infill panels, which were expanded polystyrene, and you have uh, the window surround consisting of this 9.5 millimeter thick PVC, UPVC uh, sills and you know, exterior bits. Quite a large amount of material in that. Then there were lots of other smaller components that Dr. Lane, for example, has, and uh, Professor Bisley have um, set out in their reports. Mm -hmm. Now, so far, I haven't continued, uh, considered the con contribution from any of those because they're fairly minor ones. So far, I've concentrated on the major fuel packages. But I could do so. And then, of course, once the fire has moved beyond the windows into the flat, you've got a very large <coughs> fuel mass consisting of the contents of any particular flat. So just to remind you, this is from Professor Bisbee's report. These are some of the structural materials. This is the 3 millimeter PE in the cladding. This is the PR, PIR insulation, which is two forms, 100 millimeter thick single layer on the columns and two 80 millimeter thick uh, layers on the spandrels. This is the polystyrene, which is quite a thick, but it's a very light density foam. And then you have the very dense, very heavy material, uh, which is the PVC, which is about nine and a half millimeters thick, but they were quite deep sills. So these are mainly the main materials are considered other than the contents of the flat. Just to remind you where they are then, so these are these um, XPS panels between the windows, and here is the cladding, and of course the insulation is behind it. This is a lower part of the tower where there's been limited damage. But the top of the tower there, this is, this is, this is from Bisbee's uh, report, you can see that um, there's been considerable loss of these materials. They've been burnt away. So pretty well all the rain screen cladding is gone and a considerable amount of the PIR insulation. However, as you can see here, there's quite a bit of charred PIR still left on some of these flats, particularly the spandrels, although the columns are pretty well bare. Now this is, I'm not sure when this photograph was taken, but of course I'm aware that I certainly, when I went to see the tower a year on, was seeing it at that time. And uh, so I can't say exactly what was there. <coughs> immediately after the fire. But there may be photographic evidence of that which I haven't yet uh, been shown. Then um, inside, the, um, inside the flat we've got the PVC syringe around. And this illustration is from Dr. Lane's report showing how the fire has come in around the window uh, frame and has started to decompose this PVC. Um, this is a fairly small amount involved. This was actually in flat 15 but I'm afraid you can't see it totally well, but this is from, um, I think it's Bisbee's report, which shows, or maybe it's Torero's, I forget, but, but uh, it shows that over there where some of this PVC has had much more destruction. <coughs> now, in order to estimate the potential hazard from these, the first thing I needed to know is how much material is there. And so... I took the dimensions, I had to work out the area for all these panels on the exterior, and I took the dimensions from uh, P Professor Bisbee's report to calculate the area, and then from the thickness I could work out the volume, and by using figures for the density of the material, I could work out the mass. So what I'm trying to work out here is what is the mass of these various components, in this case of the exterior materials, outside uh, a typical one or two bedroom flat. Now for the flat contents it's much more difficult because every flat is going to have different contents. We don't know what was in the contents of each individual flat. So uh, I haven't detailed how I've done this but basically I had to come up with a figure for the typical fuel load in a flat and its sort of average composition. So I went through an exercise of assessing the sort of typical amount of furniture you'd have in a typical flat in terms of mass, all the different items, cupboards, doors, wardrobes, beds, everything I could think of, even appliances, to come up with a sort of overall total fuel, combustible fuel over a flat. 
And from my knowledge of the composition of those <coughs> materials from work that we've done at VRE and, and the approximate composition of these materials, for example, if you have a wooden cupboard, it's made of wood. If you have a sort of composite one, then it's probably uh, MDF or something like that, which I know the composition of. So I can work out the mass of carbon in these various items and sum it to form, find the total proportion and mass of carbon in a typical fuel load. And the same for nitrogen, and I've also done that for chlorine. So uh, having gone through that exercise, and I will try to detail how I arrived at these figures more comprehensively in my phase two report. Uh, this is what I've come up with. And I'll say what I'm looking for here is not the exact figures, it's the, the sort of relative amounts. Have we got a large amount of something or a small amount that might be trivial in comparison, for example, with the combustible fuel load in the flat? And I'm going to focus here on two-bedroom flats because uh, most people who took refuge were in two-bedroom flats. So um, for a two-bedroom flat then, according to my calculations, which are very preliminary and subject to me checking them and looking for more information, I'm estimating that there's about 158 kilograms of PIR uh, in the insulation outside each two-bedroom flat. Uh, quite a large area. Um, the LDPE, although it's only three millimetres thick, is much denser than the PIR, and so actually quite, quite a large mass of LDPE. Um, the XPS, though, is a, quite a small amount, so we would expect that not to contribute too much. The PVC, and somebody's queried this, and I must admit I'm a little bit surprised, according to my calculations, and there was a lot of it there, and it's very heavy, very dense material, there's about 184 kilos of PVC in the window surrounds all the windows of a typical two-bedroom flat in the tower. When we come to the flat contents, this, of course, is by far the largest total item. So I would say that the, t the flat contents is going to be about 660 kilos of contents. But what this shows is that the PIR and the LDPE and the PVC are quite large, significant amounts in the context of, uh, for example, a total flat fire load. And I keep going back to my five to seven kilograms is enough to mm. burning into a flat is enough to cause a hazardous atmosphere, right? And we're talking about hundreds of kilos here. <coughs> so. Having got the total masses of materials, I then need to know what they're made of. And I've taken data uh, from, from our work, and this is all in the report. But essentially, uh, I've identified some individual materials here that we're interested in. And then you see I've got a, a, a row for the mixed flat contents. And I also, for, for comparison, put in ply, plywood and polyurethane, excuse me, foam, which is in upholstered furniture. And so what you can see immediately, of course, is that all these materials have a high carbon content, uh, the lowest being PVC. But, um, and so that means that when they burn, they will all produce a certain amount of uh, smoke, particulates, which are based, carbon-based, and they will all produce a certain amount of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, but the carbon monoxide will depend a bit on the conditions under which they're combusted. With regard to fuel nitrogen, um, PIR stands out as having quite a high nitrogen content. And the other main item with nitrogen in is the upholstered furniture, the polyurethane foam, and to some extent some fabrics and things in upholstered furniture. Um, in plywood and MDF, things like that, it's not pure wood, you have certain resins and things in, but you also have a little bit of nitrogen, as you can see there. So for the mixed flat contents, taking all the sorts of things you'd find in a flat, my estimate is overall about 50% of the mass being carbon and about 3.7% nitrogen and a little bit of chlorine. Now, the next thing we have to consider is the combustion conditions, because I've said that will affect the yield of toxic products. Well, the LDPE cladding and the XPS panels are burning mainly in open air on the building exterior. 
So I've estimated that they will be combusting under reasonably well-ventilated combustion conditions. The PIR insulation burning in the cavity is more complicated, as I explained this morning. Um, and I believe as long as it's in the cavity, uh, there's a probability that it will be burning under a somewhat underventilated combustion condition. But when the cladding falls away and exposes the PIR, then, of course, it's open to the air and will transition to a well-ventilated combustion condition. And I, we at the moment, we don't know what the overall combustion condition was for most of the combustion of the PIR. This could be resolved potentially by some form of testing strategy if we feel it was appropriate to do so. But for the purposes of my indicative assessment here, I've, because we don't know, I've used both cases. So I, I put in data for if it all was well ventilated and if it was all under ventilated. And truth should be somewhere between the two. The PVC window surround was initially well ventilated um, but the thing about PVC is that unlike other materials where the yield goes up like that with uh, vitiation, PVC has a fairly flat yield across the whole of its range. So because of the halogens in PVC, when it burns, it produces high yields of carbon monoxide even under well-ventilated air conditions. And when it's vitiated, it, it doesn't really make any difference. It all, it's more or less the same throughout the range. So I've assumed a fairly well-ventilated uh, combustion condition, but it doesn't matter. When uh, flat contents become involved, by then, uh, I've estimated the conditions would be already under-ventilated. So I've treated all the flat contents that I've used as being under this under-ventilated condition. Um, smoke and toxic gases are derived from data that are uh, produced at BRE. And... Uh, years ago, and the smoke, these are for generic materials, by the way. None of these numbers are for the actual grainful materials, but they're for the same general type of <coughs> polymer. So they should be substantially similar, but they're not. Well, so far, we haven't done any testing on actual grainful material. Um, right. Okay, so um, from all this, I've then produced this table, which I'm going to talk you through. But to start with, just go back to the scenario. So the first stage, of course, as I said this morning, is you've got this dilute smoke plume, diluted smoke plume, flowing up the side of the tower, which is not particularly hazardous. Where things become potentially hazardous is when the fire arrives at the level of your flat. Our two-bedroom flats, I believe, are the most vulnerable because they have a much greater mass of cladding insulation and window surround materials. And, of course, they go around the corner of the tower. Um, so the time to untenable conditions then depends on the area of the flat exterior and the windows involved and the timing and extent of fire involvement of the contents. Now this table shows potential contributions from materials to toxic hazards uh, in two bedroom flat and potentially the lobby beyond if the door is open or it's leaking. The first burning, so now we have to consider the order in which these things get involved. So the first burning materials generating toxic smoke into the flat are likely to be the LDPE rain screen cladding and the PIR insulation because the fire is coming up the outside of the building involving these materials first. And you remember I was talking this morning about these various routes of ingress of penetration of flame and smoke around the windows and things that Dr Lane has explained to us. So... Um, the next thing we need to consider is how of this burning material on the outside of the tower, what proportion of the products, from what proportion of the mass comes into the flat and how much goes up the outside of the tower and blows away over London. So, um, and we don't know. Uh, I don't know whether anybody could model this, but uh, it's a question. Now, what the extremes, of course, are that we could assume that none of it goes into the flat. But that's patently not the case because we've lots of descriptions from occupants of smoke actually coming in and we have Dr Lane's analysis. The other, the other extreme we could make is that all of it goes in the flat. Well, that's obviously also ridiculous because we know a lot of the smoke has gone up at the outside. So it's somewhere between the two. Now, I've used quite a conservative estimate 
for these materials. And I've assumed that of the mass that's burning, the products from only 5%, a 20th of that mass, find their way into the flat. And 95% of the smoke is going to go up and away, and not be involved. I've also, though, looked at the effects of a case where only 1% goes in, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But for the moment, for the purpose of these calculations, I've estimated about 5%, and I, I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, now, the other thing is how much of the material is burned during the fire, particularly at this stage, this early stage. Now, from what I've seen from the other experts and looking at the tower now, most of the rain screen cladding is gone. So for the purposes of this calculation, I've assumed that 100% of the polyethylene has been burned. Now, of course, some of it fell away, some of it dripped away, so be, in reality it might be somewhat less, slightly less than I'm saying. But that's what I've done for the purposes of these calculations. However, because it's all burning on the outside of the tower, it's going to produce low yields of CO. Now, when you look at the PIR insulations I showed you on the photograph, most of the PIR insulation on the columns has gone. This is a year on, of course, but it's not there now. And um, most, uh, and we've got two layers of PIR on the spandrels. And from, from what I've seen, particularly when I've been to the tower and some of these flats, the, at least the outer layer has gone, representing about 50% of the spandrel PIR mass. Um, so for the purpose of these calculations, I've assumed or estimated that 50% of the PIR has been burned during this stage of the fire. So 50% of it's burned, and of that 50%, 5% of the products find their way into the flat over this short period. The next materials to be involved are the Oh, well, more or less at the same time, actually, is the XPS panel. But again, that's burning under well-ventilated conditions, and it's a small mass. But I've, again, I've assumed 5% of those products also find their way into the mm. flat. The PVC is all going to be generated into the flat when it burns, because it's inside the flat now. But uh, for the purposes of calculation, I've taken a sort of point in time where the destruction of these sills uh, has has burnt 5% of the PVC. So it's sort of early stage of penetration. And then the next stage is going to be to involve the flat contents. And at this early stage, I've assumed that 0.5% of the flat contents, a small amount at this point in time, this snapshot of time that I'm analysing, has been burned. So that's sort of, I don't know, a quarter of an armchair's worth has got involved near, maybe near the window at this stage. And that's what I've used to create the numbers in the table. Let me just talk you through this table a little bit. So the first row in the table represents the, have I got, uh, yes, the LDPE. So uh, I'm assuming it's burning under a well-ventilated condition. And then the mass that's burned outside each flat is 90 kilograms. 5% of that is 4.7 kilograms. So it's the product from this 4.7 that we're worried about. Dispersing that into the volume of the flat gives us that mass loss concentration. And from the yield data, I can then calculate what the concentration of carbon dioxide would be in that flat. And the number that I'm coming up with is 3.5%, which is not uh, hazardous. Um, there's also some carbon monoxide, but it's quite a low concentration. And there's no cyanide because there's no nitrogen in PE. But the bit that is important is that I'm finding, I've, I've couched the smoke in terms of visibility. And I'm estimating that the visibility in the flat at a time when you've burnt 5 kilograms, 4.7 kilograms of LDPE, is 0.25 a metre, hand in front of your face. So the LDP on its own could produce dense smoke in the flat and by inference the lobby beyond the flat. Time to asphyxia is calculated using my FED equations for these gases and you see it's a long time, 160 minutes. So, so the main hazard that we're getting from the LDPE is just the smoke, the irritant visible smoke. 
Moving on to the PIR, you'll see I've got two rows here. And the upper row is assuming that all the PIR... So, so, right, sorry, I'll talk you through it again. So I've got 79 kilograms of PIR, so that's the 50% that I'm starting with. And then 5% of that is coming into the flat, and a similar concentration as the PE. And then you've got two uh, rows of gases, and the upper row is for the well-ventilated case. So this is all burning under well-ventilated conditions. Um, because uh, the PIR has a significant halogen content, it means that it always burns under a somewhat inefficient manner. And as you can see here, we're getting quite high concentrations of CO and cyanide in the flat, even under the well-ventilated case, and also quite a lot of smoke. Such that if that mass was dispersed into the volume of the flat, I'm calculating that somebody would become unconscious after 23 minutes. If it was all burning in the under-ventilated case, then we've got more asphyxiant gases, and that time comes down to only a couple of minutes. Now, of course, if we think of this as a flat six, we know that nobody died in a flat six or collapsed in a flat six. And that's because they all had time to get out before these conditions developed. So what we know for flat six is that although these gases were generating into the flat, um, particularly after people had left, uh, these gases have had no effect on their ability to escape because they all escaped into the lobby at least. Um, taking the polystyrene, uh, not much coming off that but a bit of smoke. PVC window, though, on the other hand, is quite a significant hazard because it produces very high concentrations of carbon monoxide. It doesn't produce any cyanide, but it does produce a high concentration of hyd very, very irritant hydrogen chloride gas and a lot of smoke. And it would cause, on its own, could produce incapacitation <clears throat> within about 13 minutes. And then you've got the small bit of flat contents that I've assumed has been decomposed up to this point. And because of the furniture in that, quite a lot of CO and cyanide, typical domestic furniture fire, essentially, a lot of smoke, you could survive that for about 10 minutes if you, did, if you stayed and breathed it well, you could, before you're incapacitated. Right. Uh, so the breakdown is that the toxic product from each material considered alone the LDP on its own will produce dense smoke but low concentrations of carbon monoxide. PAR on its own, dense smoke, CO and cyanide. Polystyrene, a little bit of smoke. PVC, a lot of smoke, uh, uh, hydrogen chloride and carbon monoxide. And the flat contents, smoke, carbon monoxide and cyanide. Now, of course, these things aren't decomposing individually. They're all decomposing mm -hmm. together. So all these effects are summed. Um, so because of that, I, I feel quite strongly that these, all these structural materials which are being involved in the early stages, think, thinking again in my mind of a flat six situation, are producing, capable of producing rapidly high concentrations of smoke inside a flat six and the lobby beyond. So if we think of the sort of scenario at uh, 1.30, um, when that lobby is filling with smoke. Uh, my feeling is that most of that smoke at that time is coming mainly from these structural materials burning outside the flats, particularly flat six. And this is predicted even if there's no involvement up to that time of the, of the flat contents. Well, that's the end of my presentation. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you very thank much you. indeed. Yes, Mr. Robert. Professor, can we um, deal? And would you like to take a seat? Oh, I'm up. I can sit here. That's right. Oh, that's mm -hmm. fine. Thank you. Um, could we um, start then with with the last part of your um, presentation, part three? Um, and can I ask you just pick up on the last point you were saying that um, you? You talk about the st uh, st contribution uh, from structural components, which would happen uh, irrespective of flat contents. Yes. Um, 
in your report, and I can take you to the paragraph if you want it, but you, you've mentioned that at some point in this process, flat contents will become a predominant source of toxic gases. Yes. Um, Sorry, no, I just... Yes? Uh, you reminded me of something I should have said. So, moving on from the point I've got up to in my presentation, subsequently to that, particularly after around about two o'clock, the smoke being generated in the flats and coming to the lobbies is going to be dominated by the contribution from the flat contents. <coughs> And subsequently, most of the smoke in the lobbies throughout the fire is going to be dominated by, in origin by the burning flat contents with some contribution from the cladding and things. But, so this situation has moved on. Sorry to interrupt you. So, well, um, th that prompts my question because in, in the uh, answer you've just given, you said s sometime after 2 o'clock. Yeah. What's the basis for you giving that time? Right, but I suppose I'm referring back to my situation this morning. There are, there are, there are a couple of things going on here. One is that, well, the main, the main thing is because we, we have photographs from the outside of the tower around about that time. Um, I thought I had one to show somewhere, but maybe I showed it this morning. I think I showed you one this morning where was, was um, that the, sorry, you can sorry. see the outline of the windows. Mm -hmm. bright with, with flame inside, indicating serious fires inside those flats. And if there's a serious fire like that inside the room, that, that can, must be the burning contents. Right. Was that, the, that was the Luke Bisbee photograph you showed in your second part of your presentation, yes, which was, was yeah. marked with the time as closer to 2.23 a.m.? That's the one, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, in terms of, of flat contents playing a role, um, what's the basis for saying that two o'clock applies to all flats? No, it doesn't. Sorry. Um, one thing that's really starting to show up more as the more we look into this, is there's quite a variation between the extent and timing of penetration of fire to involve the contents of different flats up and around the tower. So there's, there's a variation. But some, some flats at around this time, quite a lot, if you look at the pictures, and I think um, Professor Torero has given us a breakdown of this, had gone to full involvement, but others hadn't. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Um, uh, but, but applying it logically, and if you take a flat six as an example, where you, and you've, you've spoken about flat six today, and, and talked about, and let's take an example of flame coming in through the kitchen window. Yeah. Would, um, if you have flat contents on, on the kitchen counter, for example, or in the area of the kitchen, would flat contents not immediately begin to play a role? Yes, I mean, we, uh, I mean I'm again going back to flat six at the moment because I've looked at this a bit more in detail because I'm interested in this early development. If you read the uh, witness statements from various occupants of, for example, the flat sixes all the way up the column, the tower, you'll see that there's quite a variety of... I, I, I thought I'd said this, but anyway, I'm going to say it now. There's quite a variety of ways in which smoke and or flame uh, first breaks into those flats. So typically, these people were alerted at quite an early stage, and they went in to, say, their kitchen, and then they described what they saw. And some people said, um, I saw flames coming around the windows or through the windows. Some people said, I, there was a crack and the window fell out. Some people had a window open. Some people, however, quite a lot of people's first um, experience was of smoke. Two people I remember reading describe the early stages of involvement of the curtains and blinds around the window. One person, I forget who it was, said that they actually pulled these things down and stamped them out. Um, another person had some kind of curtain up between the kitchen and the, and the sliding doors to the lounge, and this curtain caught fire. So there were certainly some instances of some materials in the vicinity of the windows, in some cases being involved at quite an early stage. So I think we're going to see a variety. And would it be fair to say that what we've got to remember is, is the point you've made from your BRE experience that you just need five to seven kilograms of, of a material to yes. be combusted to be getting gases which are hazardous? Yes. Uh, and um, obviously the kind of gases generated would depend on the material. Of course, yeah. But um, I think you described it in your first presentation as 
um, a third of half an armchair. So it's a, a third to a half. A, yeah. third to, a third to a half of an armchair is yeah. what would be... In, a, in the enclosed volume of a house or a flat. Yeah. Um, well, can I take you back um, um, just to... Again, we're sticking with uh, what you were just discussing recently, but just to kind of, uh, again, ask you a few, a few more details about the processes you've outlined in that presentation. And it might help if we just look at your uh, report. Can we have, please, um, DAPR 601 at page 63? <laughs> Can we expand paragraphs 204 to 206, please? Um, in these paragraphs, Professor, uh, this is where you're, you're setting out your analysis of, of what you've described as the three fuel packages of interest. Um, and we see that in um, each of them, if we look at, you, you've given uh, an estimated density. Yes. Could you explain, or can you explain, how you come to estimate these densities? Yes, I can. And I slightly apologise for not having really had time yet to set all this out in my report. I will put all the, all the sources of all this information, although I'm hoping to find better information. This is all very preliminary. But basically, what we, the main information, or the, the areas uh, and volumes come from the other expert reports. But, the density, but I, in order to work out the mass, I need a term for density. And uh, I, I came across a uh, data sheet for Celatex, which told me the density of the 100 and the 80 millimeter thick foam, so many 3.8 kilograms per meter squared or something like that for those panels. So that's the source of my density data for those. Okay. And that was being provided to me. I think it's a MET document. It's been provided to me with those information in. And, and for the rain bond rain screen cladding, how did you? I don't have a figure for that. So I, I, I looked up. Uh, I think I got it from the BPF website, but I, I can't remember exactly. But I looked up typical figures for the density of PE. It's about a density of one because it's more or less floats. So and I've worked with it a lot myself, uh, and I've used that. So that's an estimated figure. And so what we can, if, if necessary, what we can do, of course, now we have samples from the tower, is we can measure the exact density of all these materials. But I don't have that information as yet, so I've had to estimate figure. So is this something that you could consider doing for phase two? Yes. Um, could I ask you to pick up one, one thing in paragraph 206? Um, just can you explain how you come up with um, a mass of 26.26 kilograms per yes. window? yes. A lot, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the, it's, what I've done is I've worked out the... Um, I found a figure, and I've, I must admit I've forgotten where I got it from now. For the, I think I measured it off one of the plans for the depth of the um, sills. Mm -hmm. From memory, it's something like 36 centimetres or something. Anyway, so I've got a figure for the depth. I know the perimeter distance... So from depth times perimeter distance, that's the area of PVC panelling around each window. I know that it's 9.5 millimetres thick from Bisbee, and then I needed a density. So again, I've, I've looked up to find out you know, what I can. I've, and I've, I've, I've used a figure, I think, of 1.5 grams per centimetre cubed. But that's... Um, uh, and and that's, that's what I've used so far. It could be slightly less, but I think that's a reasonable figure. It's very heavy stuff, PVC, because there's all the chlorine in it. So, um, and then when I uh, multiply that up by the number of windows and the area, that's the mass that I'm getting. And I did try and check it last night. I'm, I'm still, at the moment, I'm still sticking to that figure, but uh, arithmetic is always a weakness. can always be a weakness in people. But I will be thoroughly checking all this, obviously, phase two. Um. Could we go um, two pages ahead in your um, report, please, to page 65 and look at table two? Um, as we can see, it's headed composition of test materials. And, and um, you've explained in, in your oh, report. Yeah. Um, and if 
you, if you oh, need yes, yes, the yes. explanation you've given is at paragraph 213, which is on the previous page, yeah. Professor. But you explained that it shows net heat of combustion yeah. and this stoio stoichiometric oxygen demand and yeah. element composition of yeah. 14 common polymeric, polymeric materials used in furnishing building products. I think what you've done is taken um, materials that would, would have appeared or been in use at, at, at the tower and also would appear in flat contents. Well, actually, this, yeah, I've selected from that list, but that list is the list of materials that we tested at BRE, where we measured all these, we me had these are measured. Um, can you explain the term uh, sto stereochiometric <laughs> oxygen demand? It's the, it's the amount of oxygen you need to, to burn each gram of material to completion. And why is that important to the calculation that you were doing here? It's not. It's, not. Um, it's important. Um, it just happened to be in the table and it's used for other purposes in our calculations. Mm -hmm. If we could have the whole page, um, and I draw your attention to what you've said in um, paragraph 215, um, and you're, you're speaking there to the two most important combustible polymers. Uh, on the exterior. The yeah. two you give are the low-density polyethylene and the polyisocyanurate yeah, right. foam. Um, why are they the most important combustible polymers in terms of smoke toxicity? They're the most important because there's so much of them. There's a large mass. Um, They're most important as an input to the toxicity calculation because there's so much to consider, as I've described. <clears throat> In other words, the XPS, for example, as I said, is a small amount of material, therefore less significant. What you've said in your report is that the main relevance of the data that you set out in Table 2 uh, is, when one's reading, is firstly, and I, you, you've touched on this in your presentation, is carbon content. Yes. Because that affects generation of smoke particulates and so, carbon yeah. oxides, including carbon monoxide, yeah. during combustion. Yeah. The second thing is nitrogen content, yes. which affects generation of hydrogen cyanide. Yeah. Um, and then halogen content, which is chlorine and bromine, yeah. uh, which determines the potential to generate irritant acidic gases. And affects the combustion of the other part. Uh, and what you've done, if we look at table three on the next page. Yes is um, you've summarised... I think it's just extracted from the yeah. other table. Well, yes, yeah. you've summarised the percentages of these elements, carbon, nitrogen and chlorine here, yes. in the materials um, found, and, and this relates to materials found at Grenfell, but also mixed flats contents. <coughs> yeah. Does it follow that the percentages you give here um, are the percentages of these elements that will be produced when a sample of that combustible material is burnt completely? If, yeah, so basically what that means is that this is the, these are the percentages in the pedigree material before it's burned, right? If it's all burned and 100% is burned, then all of those masses of elements or percentage of elements per unit mass will come off as combustion products. I think that was a yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, what presumably the proportions will remain constant if for any part of it that's right. Burned. Well, no, that not right? Ne yes, good point. Not necessarily. So, if that's a, if 100% is burned, then of course it all goes. Hmm. But if there's any char remaining uh -huh. or partial decomposition, then um, the proportions can change. So, in char forming materials, for example, it locks up some of the carbon, hmm. which means that the carbon then goes up into the atmosphere is somewhat less than it would be if you had 100% combustion. Yeah. And the same for the other. Well, that's the carbon mainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can, I, I'll, can I come back to the question of charring in yes. due course? Yeah, um, of course. The, um, one of the points you make, and it's a point you've, you've um, reiterated here, by, by you've used the term indicative analysis for the work that you've, you've done in, uh, and set out in part three of your presentation, but you mm. also explain in your report that estimates of the um, contributions of combustion products from specific materials to the concentrations of toxic smoke products in any particular locations within the tower at different times 
is likely to be possible only within quite wide ranges of uncertainty. Of course, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And if we look at table four, which is um, where you're looking at, table four is yeah. That's these are these are these are the yields of all the products that we measured in our um, PRE uh, experiments using our tube furnace method. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the first question was going to be: Can you explain the reference to tube furnace? <laughs> yes, okay. As I've explained, the um, yields uh, of toxic products are very dependent upon the combustion conditions, this fuel air ratio. And for this project that we were doing, we were particularly concerned to try and produce some data for uh, youth for engineers to use on the yields they might expect over a range of conditions. Now I've put in, in this table a snapshot of well ventilated and under ventilated and I did actually at one point have some slides showing this, I've, I've spared you. But in fact you get a sort of sigmoid curve of yield in relation to uh, equivalence ratio. So in order to, to measure these <coughs> amounts um, I developed this uh, tube furnace method uh, which involves putting a strip of material into a tube furnace under a stream of air. And because it's designed in that way, you can uh, dial up, if you like, choose specific fuel-air ratios, ensure that the material burns under the, a defined condition, uh, and then measure the yield that you get. Now, one thing you have to be aware of <coughs> with any bench-scale test is that you have to be careful that the results you're getting in your small-scale test, and this applies to a whole range of standard and quasi-standard tests, that the yields and things that you're getting, to what extent they're representing fundamental properties of the material you're testing, and to what extent they're a kind of byproduct of the apparatus that you're using. And this apparatus was designed specifically to have complete knowledge and control of the exact combustion get as far as it's possible to do so in a practical apparatus. But when we were developing this and getting data for it, we were very anxious to validate it against large-scale compartment fire, which is what we're talking about here. And so we conducted... Now, of course, large-scale fires are very expensive to do, so we could only do a limited number. But we conducted a number of large-scale fires using the same materials to look at the yields we got in these more realistic large volumes to compare with the yields we were getting in our small-scale apparatus. And we found good agreement. Um, and I, in fact, I recently published a paper on this in 2016 addressing this very issue. So I'm fairly confident that the results that we've got are predictive of the kinds of yields you might get under the, if, you, if, these, if and when these prisms are produced in a compartment fire. If we go then um, to the next page in your report, <coughs> page 70, please. No, sorry, can we go to page 69? Yes, it's 70, sorry. Sorry, there. Um, could we expand paragraphs 230 and 231, please? Um, um, this is where you're, you're, you're touching on ventilated and underventilated conditions, Professor, because you say yeah. at... Um, Paragraph 230, the LDP cannot burn while encased in its aluminium skin, but yeah. it does so when it melts and drips out from aluminium outer layers and also when they start to delaminate and expose the LDP core. Since these processes occurred in the open air on the outer surface of the tower, it's likely that most of the flaming LDP combustion occurred under well-ventilated flaming combustion conditions. And so, um, as you've explained in your presentation, well-ventilated conditions would result in low yields of irritant and toxic smoke. Yes, there would be some smoke, but uh, not quite as much yeah, um, as you get. If we look at paragraph 231, <coughs> you say the combustion conditions for the PIR insulation are more complex because at least initially it's believed to have been burning in the enclosed cavity behind the rain screen cladding on the columns and spandrels and also in cavities associated with the window surrounds. Can I just be clear there? You're making, are you making a distinction between PIR insulation that's in either three or two places? So it's either PIR insulation behind the cladding on the columns, behind the cladding on the spandrels, 
and also in the cavities associated with the window surround. Right. All right. Let me just think and talk through that. Basically, the, the two main locations are on the columns and on the spandrels, where the bulk of the PIR is. There are also one or some smaller inserts and things in the window surround, but I'm not considering those at the moment. I, what I'm, I think I'm really getting at here is that, and this goes back to uh, Dr. Lane's kind of analysis, that when you have uh, the PIR burning on the columns, particularly next to a kitchen window, the gasified thermal decomposition products are finding their way through these gaps, particularly where the EDPM strip is or has been lost, into the area around the windows. And so some of the combustion from the column PIR products, the gases produced, is occurring in these kind of areas. And so I'm saying that where it's burning in the cavity actually on the column and where the column-generated material is burning in these kind of gaps and cavities and things around the windows, under both those situations, it's likely to have an element of underventilated combustion. I think that's really what I'm yeah. saying. But, I mean, there is a bit of PIR there as well, oh, in its own right. <clears throat> when you were um, making um, or reaching this view about um, the degree of ventilation of the PIR insulation, um, di did you take into account the fact that the rain screen facade at Grenfell Tower was a ventilated rain screen cladding system. Right, I'm not quite sure exactly what's meant by that, but obviously what you, the way I'm looking at this is that you have the PIR on the concrete and then you've got a, a cavity going up, which is stopped of course in places, or that's, that's another matter of dispute of course. Right. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a column going up, which at least is, allows air to flow initially. And then you've got the rain screen cladding. So the basic sort of situation is that the PIR is in an in enclosure, a pipe almost. Right? Um, and as I described this morning, once that, you get a fire in there, it's likely for that to become underventilated. Now, if there are various locations where there are gaps to let a bit more air in, if that's what's meant by this question, then if any air that gets in is going to assist combustion and may shift that phi value in one direction or the other. If, however, some of that PE, which I've said is well ventilated, because I'm, I'm envisaging it pouring down the outside, if some of that PE is actually dripping on the inside of the cavity burning in the inside of the cavity, that will make the conditions, it's adding fuel and therefore making the conditions even more vitiated, underventilated. But, um, but in terms so of... So I didn't of specifically consider, other than the fact that air goes up the inside the column, I didn't yeah. think of any but other particular... <coughs> I think maybe the point that um, you're being asked to consider is this, that we know that the rain screen cladding yeah. had gaps right. d designedly Right. Probably not very large, perhaps an inch, perhaps two inches. Between the sort of segments. Between the segments. I didn't consider that. No. <coughs> no, no. But I did assume that there would be some airflow available. You know. As I said, we don't know what the condition actually was, and that's why I put in both cases. <coughs> well, um, uh, just to break that down a little bit more, I mean, so firstly, in terms of uh, your conclusion that the LDPE was well ventilated, what the assumption you made was that it would seep out on the outside. Yes. In terms of uh, PIR insulation being underventilated, you've not taken into account the gaps in no, the cladding. No, I haven't. No. Um, did you take into account the gaps that would have existed bet between the insulation panels and the and the um, the cladding itself? That's the, that's cavity, the cavity. Yes, yes, that's so the that you did take into yes, account. Yes. Yeah. And in the, it, to the extent that it's there. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. did you take into account that there would have been air present of within course, that cavity? Yes, because that's what supports the initial combustion. Um, you've, I think, responded uh, to this already in that you, you, you've said that um, there would have been air flow up. Yes. Um, 
in looking at the um, ventilation of the uh, or, or the rain the cladding system, did you consider that the response to heat might be the creation of an updraft? I mean, I haven't gone to this level of detail, but I'm assuming that there is air flowing up and that the, there's a flame, mm. an elongated flame, in fact. You remember the series of diagrams. Mm. Um, so I'm assuming an air flow up, yes. But I haven't, I haven't, um, I don't have any figures for any of these flows or loss rates. I haven't done anything like that. All I've done is addressed the mass and uh, estimated a mass that's been burned and then assumed either one or the other condition. Yeah. Is that um, a factors like that, 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 um, that you might get flow up or that there are gaps in the cladding matters that you could take into account if you were to review these calculations? Um, at present, I mean, this is something we might be able to go into um, further in phase two, but really to settle these kind of issues, the only way that I would know to do that is to build a rig with these features and, and have a fire in it and measure these phenomena. So I, I don't have any way of calculating this other than to say um, the product you're going to get will depend on this fuel-air ratio that you end mm. up with in practice. I don't have any way of calculating that for this particular situation. Mm. <clears throat> um. Professor Bisbee's um, has noted that um, in terms of the LDPE, it was exposed at the edges. Yes. Um, I think he talked about drips and things, didn't he? Yeah. But are you able to say w w what impact that would have on the process of combustion? Well, I was a little bit puzzled by this question. So, I, I mean, my picture of this is that if you do have an edge and there's a flame impinging upon that edge, mm. this is the three millimetre gap between the two sheets of aluminium, then being a thermoplastic material, that LDP is going to melt and drip, and you'll have these sort of burning stream of droplets dropping from below this. So we're not talking about a vertical panel, so it's flowing out, dripping down and burning. That's the, what I would, I would anticipate happening. Uh, and so to the extent that those drips are on the outside and in air, I would expect them to burn quite efficiently. And then uh, at, at some point, one would expect the whole thing to delaminate as it loses its structural integrity. Mm. And uh, then, of course, all the PE is exposed to the air. So at the moment, I'm, I'm basing this on a model of that it's all well ventilated, but uh, I'm not... Um, <coughs> you know, Terribly, too totally wedded to this. I mean, should other information appear? Um, can I show you um, a page from uh, Dr. Lane's report? Could I have, please, um, BLAS 5010 and then uh, 0020? Um, could we expand just the top diagram, please? I'm just going to have to come out and look at this because I've. Yeah, right. Make I can't sure see, it see it in there. Make sure you can see it right. Yeah. If you, can oh, you Sam see... Here, is that all right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. If you see, Dr. Uh, Professor Purser, that, um, that, that there's a sort of red and yellow arrow yeah. going up. Yeah. Um, that, I think, represents the um, LDP... Uh, core. Core. So yes. you have, you have a, a, P, a, a polyethylene core with t uh, two aluminium faces. Yes. Um, could you get flaming up this three millimetre uh, in, in that space? Core okay. With no delamination of the aluminium sides. You could do for a period, but I mean, not, this is getting a bit out of my is, expertise. It's not but quite your area. No, but let's assume for the moment that you do, right? If that helps to answer the question. So, what we would have is a situation where initially the flame is impinging upon this edge and it's dripping down and then burning below, as I've described. If that starts to flow out, say, up to this sort of level here, then you're going to have um, the sort of melting PE sort of running inside this sort of space. But, of course, if it's going to burn, it's got to get air up there as well, which isn't going to be that easy. So I would still expect the main... There could be a bit of combustion in there, which may assist the delamination process, of course. 
I'm just getting a bit out of my. Well, I, I, won't, I won't press it. I'll ask you. You can go back. You can go out yes, the door. You can take your seat again. Yes. <clears throat> and let's go back to your own. Um, the same page on, on, on your report in paragraph two three one again, please. Um, you refer to uh, rain screen cladding falling away. Yeah. Um, would you agree that there would have been variability as to the time when this occurred? Of course, yeah. And would that then have a consequence for the combustion conditions for the yes, cladding yes. and for the PIR as it insulation? Would, yeah. yeah. Uh, in relation to the analysis that you've done, and I think I know the answer to this, but is this something that, that, that could be taken into account? And if so, how? <laughs> right, well... Assuming that the, the same mass is decomposed, um, in the one case with the cladding intact and the other case with it having fallen away, something like that, then of course if it remained intact, then it preserves this cavity which tends to lead to, or more likely to lead to, underventilated combustion. So if it, if it stays, if the rain stream cladding remains in place for a longer period, you would theoretically prolong the period of underventilated combustion of the PIR. If the, if the cladding falls away at a very early stage, then you move to the more well-ventilated regime at an earlier stage for the PIR, I would say. Okay. And that, that could be, yeah, we could, do, we could do example calculations of this, yeah. should it be relevant, but I don't... As far as we're concerned, at least at the moment, um, are your calculations based on what you would consider to be a reasonable average condition? Exactly. Or have well, you gone for one extreme or the other? Yes, I mean, uh, the most extreme thing in this table is that I've assumed that all the cladding around the flat in question is equally affected, affected, yeah. right? So if, for example, you had a two bedroom flat and the fire came up only in a column near the kitchen, say a flat six, and never spread laterally to involve any other cladding or insulation, mm. then of course my figures come down in proportion to the area that's been, I think I did say this, that it all mm. depends on the area, the area that's been attacked and destroyed mm. by the fire, which varies somewhat between flats. But I'm taking a case here, sort of one of these sort of fairly typical flats high up in the tower, where most of it's gone, apart from the charry bit that's left behind. And so, so that we're clear, when, when I'm asking you about Table 5, which you put up in your presentation. Yes. Um, what, that doesn't, what, what you're not doing is trying to represent varying conditions no. throughout the tower and, and it throughout be, the progress of the incident. It would, uh, right. Now, as I said earlier, this, this sort of analysis, I, I'm kind of looking at a snapshot of a few minutes mm. During the early stages of fire penetration, for example, into a flat six, well, of course, the same would apply to all the other flats later on that were penetrated. Um, uh, and in this particular set of calculations, I'm estimating that all the PIR and all the rain screen has been affected on both sides of the flat, the corner location, it's all gone. And that it's all gone in this short period of time as well. I mean, it would be possible to do a, a very set of calculations with various assumptions to look how they might spread, but uh, that's essentially what I'm doing. Yeah. Can I ask? You proceeded on the basis that only five percent of the yes. smoke generated by a hundred percent combustion yes. gets into the flat. Yes. To what extent would a departure from your assumption yes. be likely to affect the? Proportion or the, the the volume of smoke getting into yes. the flat. Well, it would it would be in proportion for these two materials on the outside. Right. So a twenty percent difference would only result in a one percent yeah. difference of smoke. I mean, I, is, I, that, is that one percent difference in smoke volume? I, 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 I well, I ran a case for I've assumed a five percent uh, uh, a fifth twenty percent is going in. Sorry, no, no, five percent five percent, and I also had a look at the case for only one percent going in. And what I found with the 1% case for these two materials was that 
Um, it lowers the concentration, obviously, of the asphyxiant gases. Mm. So it prolongs the predicted time to collapse. Not that that happened in any part six. Um, but uh, there's so much smoke there that even when you do this, you still end up with hand in front of the face smoke. Mm. And that's just from one each material. Um, and the total thing has got to be summed for the... So just so to make I sure I've understood you correctly. Yeah. I think what you're saying is that even if you... Uh, reduce the, vol the quantity of materials consumed by 20%. Yes, it wouldn't make much difference. Well, I can say, because you're, you're reducing the smoke into the flat by 1%, one, one percent, mm. as it were, from the are, fire, and it doesn't make much difference. No, because there are two, oh, yeah. there are kind of two things here. One is the smoke density, and a change like that, because it's so dense, mm. it, it won't really affect the visibility. Right. Yeah. But it does reduce in proportion the concentrations of asphyxiant gases yep. and prolongs in proportion the tolerance time for those. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Approximately. Um, uh, one of the points you make in your, in your report, and it's a paragraph 210, I won't ask for it to be brought up, um, but it's what, what you say is that um, the components that you've been discussing, if they were involved in a fire, they'd be involved in an order, and you, you put it as running from left to right, and so then you state, the first smoke to which flat occupants were exposed came from the PIR and LDPE, then the PS, which is the polystyrene, PVC and other minor window uh, components, and finally the flat contents. You continue, for occupants taking ref refuge in flats remote from the fire for an hour or more, but exposed to smoke infiltration from the outside and the lobbies, or in the lobbies or stair. The source was derived from a mixture of all these sources in varying proportions at different times. Yeah, including the contents. Yeah. So, can you clarify or, or help us further with what factors you had in mind when you, when you mm. state that uh, any mixture from these sources would vary in proportion and yeah. at different times? Well, yes. Yeah, so, so I mean, it's not terribly quantitative, but what I'm saying is that it's a progression. So you start off thinking of flat six again, with the exterior and structural <coughs> materials um, as the main source during these early minutes up to about 01, 30, 35, something like that. And that's going into the lobbies and giving you dense smoke in the lobbies. And then most of that is derived from the structural materials because the fire hasn't yet started to grow in the flats. Mm -hmm. After that, um, as time goes on, um, we can expect and we can observe uh, fire development inside the flats. And so we get, and we're getting an increasing involvement of the contents, which as I said earlier, are a much bigger fire load. And so once we get on, and this is variable of course between floors and flats and times, but once we get, start to approach 0200 hours, we can see that a lot of these flat contents are on fire and they're going to dominate the combustion products that are being formed. Some of that's going to go out through the... Most of it may go out through the windows if the windows have failed. But, of course, the proportion is going to find its way into the lobby. So if you were in another flat taking refuge um, and you try to open your lobby door at 2 o'clock, that smoke that confronts you in the lobby is now starting to be more dominated, I would say, by combustion products from from contents of other burning flats than <coughs> from the cladding and other materials. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. Um, again, just picking up on that last thing, and if we, if we need to take it to the paragraph, we will, but, but what you say, and it's paragraph 248, is that during actual fires, the fuel burning rates and concentrations of smoke and toxin products are not constant. No, of course. But increase continuously yes. as long as the fire is burning. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, does that mean that the, the, the concentration of gases changes would vary throughout the building depending on the, mm. on the progress of the fire? Well, this is where it all starts to get very complicated. So you can consider the situation in an individual flat, and of course that's all varying with time. These, these, cons these calculations here are for a kind of snapshot in, in that time. And they would have been preceded by some kind of growth mm. curve and then mm. followed by a further growth curve. Right? But um, once you get beyond the burning flat into other parts of the tower, you're starting to get into more complex questions about 
smoke leakage through various doors and shafts and, <coughs> and, and, stuff, but, and I've forgotten what your question was but essentially uh, it, it, you've got a large generator in all the burning flats and still and the fire on the exterior producing smokes some of the exterior smoke is finding its way into the building and all the building smoke is being produced in the building some of it's going out some of it's going out going up and coming in at higher levels there's a whole lot of things going on mm. and um, and then that, that smoke is migrating through the various interior spaces of the building. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. yes, thank you. Um, one of the slides that you put up when you were setting out the, the, the materials that you'd, uh, you, you'd considered a, a, for the analysis that you set out in this part of your report, uh, you made the point that um, what you did not bring into play was other materials. So if you mention you specifically list the pearl board yes. and the um, EDPM. Yes. Um, and, and when you were presenting, you said that th these are minor. Um, can you just expand on why you yeah. you did not uh, include such combustible materials in in your yes, analysis? Yes, I can. Yeah. The short answer is because I was trying to do a preliminary figure, and so I picked the things that I thought were most significant in terms of mass. But I. I'm aware that these other materials are there. Also, it's quite hard to, from the information I have to quantify them. I don't know necessarily from Barbara exactly what the dimensions are of all these things. But um, I can go on to include them in, in further, further work. The EDPM is quite a small piece. Of, I mean, it's quite important as to whether or not it was a barrier. But in terms of its contribution by mass, it's quite a small amount. The pearl board might have some significance, and I think there's some wood underneath all this somewhere as well. Yeah. So the short answer is I, I could, I probably will go on to kind of expand these elements I'm considering, but because they're relatively small in comparison to these, I don't, they will make some contribution. Um, the, 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 there's a foil facer to the PIR insulation. Is that, yes. is that material that you, you would want to consider? if you reviewed this analysis? A foil face? Face it to the PIR insulation. Well, that, the, the, you mean the aluminium foil that's, mm. on the, that's on all the PIR? Yeah. Well, would that, if, if that were burnt, if the PIR oh, burning, would I that be significant? I haven't considered the aluminium itself, and I don't think that would produce anything very much. I mean, its main significance is the extent to which it protects the PIR from combustion. And to some extent, it does quite a good job on that up to a point. And is that something that you could take in, in, into consideration, that, that protective mechanism of the aluminium? No, not really. No. But would it, would it be relevant to the sort of calculations you're no, doing? No, no. I mean, it's only relevant, it's relevant to the extent of whether or not the PIR burned. And so I'm basing that yeah. on what we you're observe. Making, you're so assuming it is going to burn. Well, I'll tell you, yeah. I, I did a series of experiments where I lined a standard room, it's called an ISO room, with aluminium-faced PIR. And the purpose was to study the combustion of these materials when they're used as wall linings. And um, because I wanted to have the same material uh, only in the room, I made uh, what's called a crib, which is a standard ignition fire source that experimenters use, whereby you, you saw, usually it's wood, but you saw the amount of sticks and you build a kind of Boy Scout mm. crib you set fire to that, and depending on the crib, you can have a standard heat source, fire source, flame and heat source. So we did some experiments. We sawed up PIR and made it into cribs and ignited it, and it burned quite fiercely under those artificial conditions. Um, we calibrated that to get the right heat output and then put it into this ISO room, which is now lined with PIR aluminium-faced panelling. And what happened in these experiments is that the standard flame size flame in the corner of this room never penetrated the aluminium and never involved the PIR. So in that particular case, it performed very well. All right. Mr. Rabbit, I'm just wondering whether we should have a break at some point, um, but I don't want to take a no, point we, we can, we doesn't can, suit you. We can stop now, I think. Does uh, it suit you? Yes. yes. I'll just, um, I, I mean, I, I've got a few more questions on this topic, but it's, it's, going to, it's, it's a good enough time. So it's fine. Thank you. Professor, I think we'll have a short break now. Thank you very much. Um, ten minutes, let's say, 25 yes, past three. Yep. Um, don't talk to anyone about your evidence, please, as before. Yeah. Okay. And we'll go with the usher.
Sure. Yes, I will, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, 25 past three then, please.
Good. Ready to carry on, Professor? Yes, Good. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Rowan. Uh, we have um, Table 5 up on the screen. That's at page 74 of the report, please. Um, Professor, one of the assumptions you made um, in this, as you, and as you describe it, indicative analysis, was that 0.5% of the flat contents would burn. Yes, a very small amount. Uh, yeah. Why did you choose that percentage? Yeah. That's, a, that's a, it is an important question. Basically because I'm addressing these conditions at a sort of moment in time, as I said, when the fire has just broken in. I'm thinking again of flat six mainly here. And it's coming in around the windows, and it's either still around the windows and hasn't involved the contents at all, or it's just started, mm. say, to ignite a chair or something close to the window. So we're getting some involvement of the content. So, so this is a sort of a snapshot of a situation possibly um, around 1.40, 1.50, 2 o'clock, I don't know. Something like that, depending on the flat. Mm. But, it's, but, but I mean, you know, obviously after this, if we did another snapshot later on, I would expect that bottom line to become much, much yeah. bigger in significance. So that as, as one moves through um, the incident in time, yes. the um, estimate of different components that, that, that burn would, would very, change? Very, a lot, yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely, yes. Because if, for example, the, 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 the cladding had fallen away outside a particular flat and the flat contents were increasing. increasing. Yeah. So one is going down in significance and the other is going up. Mm. Um, in terms of um, when you made this calculation, you, you, um, and you've touched on this in your presentation, but you gave uh, a figure of 50% for the total mass of PIR. Oh, yes. Um, mm. And you, uh, and this is something you say in your, in your report, but... You, you estimated following a visit at, uh, on the tower that approximately 50% of the PIR may have burned. On, on particular parts, yes. Well, well, can I'm you not just... taking into account the, when half the bottom of the tower is still intact, so I'm not including that at all mm. in this. I'm, I'm sort of, not, I'm thinking of a, of a sort of stereotypical flat in a certain, you know, certain, up towards the top of the tower sort of thing. Yeah. And, and was this, a, a, assumption based purely on the observations that you made during a visual observation yeah. during your visits. So one of the problems when I went there was that the whole tower is clad in a sort of a mm. membrane, so you can't sort of do a survey from the outside w without climbing out onto the scaffolding. So what I did personally was I went into various flats and went to the window and looked at the state on the columns and panels around various flats. And, uh, but I'm also looking at some of the photographs that you can see of so many of them taken after the fire, yeah. uh, which I showed in one of my slides, where you can see that, for example, you can see that the columns have got no PIR on most of them, but you still, still definitely can see quite, I mean, there are substantial amounts of PIR still there, even mm. near the top of the tower on some of these, on some mm. of these spandrels. Most of the column stuff has gone though. Um, so, is it right to say that you didn't take, in making your estimates, you, you didn't take any account of the volume of um, PIR that may have fallen off during the fire no. or been removed by firefighting efforts? No, obviously I'm aware that that may have happened to some extent, but I'm, I'm purely basing it on, on what I can observe, you know. Um, it, as I understand your, your analysis here, you're, you're assuming that, um, and let's take the PIR installation as an example, that a percentage of it burns and a potent percentage of that burnt material then enters the flat. Yes. Um, is it possible that some of the PIR insulation may have been burned <laughs> as a result of fire breakout from compartment fires after the cladding had burnt out? Yes, I saw that question. That's an interesting point. So. I think what we, what basically what we seem to be seeing is the fire during the early stages moving rapidly up the tower. Mm -hmm. And the very bright flames that we can see, I mean, the other experts would comment, but I mean, I think that's mainly the, a lot of that's the LDPE, but it's also burning some of the PIR behind it. Mm -hmm. Then once the fire has moved on, that photo I showed you where the fire is burning to the left of the original um, and you can see the fire inside. Um, there's obviously still some PIR left 
on those. I know it is stop burning. It stop burning. But if you had the fire in the flat, then going to flash over, and you had the windows falling out. And I haven't seen any pictures that show this, but you'd had a big flame plume coming out, which should happen, and that flame plume then goes up the outside towards the next level. If, if that's impinging on a spandrel above the window level, one would expect that to be attacked. Mm. Um, so I've not taken that into account. And so my assumption, which may be, you know, uh, is that the mass I'm saying has gone during this fairly short window of time that I'm addressing. If, in fact, it was going over a longer period of time, then that would reduce the amount during that window of time. Work. Um, what, one of the, the, the points you mentioned um, earlier was, was the idea of charring. Yes. Um, and um, as I understand it, PIR on its own, when burned, will char and self-extinguish. Yes. Is that right? When you were coming to your approximation of 50% of PIR burning, did you assume that any charred insulation had been consumed in the fire? Mm. What I looked at was the thickness. And for this kind of indicative calculation, um, and I'm thinking mainly of the spandrels here, but that's the same logic I've applied to the other, is that you've got two aluminium faced layers. So it's so if one of those layers is gone, and that's what I observed appeared to have happened, then that's 50% of your PIR gone. So I've assumed all that's combusted. Right? But behind that is the layer that the windows are set in, which is still attached in places to the uh, concrete of the building. And, and that is all blackened and charred and sort of bulbous. And in fact, we took some specimens of this and sawed through them. And if you look at a cross-section of one of these charred pieces, it looks a bit like uh, a loaf of bread that's been burnt in the oven, you know, so that you've got this kind of charred exterior um, of a certain thickness, which is the way this is designed to happen. And then behind that, you've got mm. some creamy-looking, uh, apparently intact PIR that's not been decomposed at all. But from the bit that's charred, that has, in fact, although there is significant carbon still left, which is the char, um, that will have lost a considerable part of its mass. And so if, for example, you had a case where 50% had burned and gone, that's your 50%, if you had 50% left of which 50% of the mass content had gone, leaving the charred bit, then you would end up with 75% of the total mass decomposed, which would be... 50% more than I've assumed. Mm. So it can kind of go in either direction, depending on, on what mm. you say. Mm. I mean, one of our plans is to, is, to, is to look at the density of this charred material and estimate how much actually has gone um, from the specimens removed from the tower. Um, if we look at um, Table 5, um, you give a figure of um, 552 parts per million. Hydrogen chloride for hydrogen chloride, yes. yes, and that's from the um, UPVC windows yes. around. Yes. Uh, would that hydrogen chloride, uh, as produced by the, um, the PVC window, have an impact on the efficiency of combustion conditions for Absolutely. other materials? Absolutely, and I stated that in my report. Well, yes. can, you, can you just explain how it has that impact? Yes. So I've only factored that into my calculation. I mentioned it as a phenomenon, but I've only factored it into my calculations here in Savar as it affects the PVC itself. Right? So PVC, when you burn it, uh, even when you burn it with a flame, which is quite hard to do, um, uh, it produces, as I've said, a very high yield of carbon monoxide. And that is because the chlorine content, is 50% by mass, roughly chlorine, mm. is all released as hydrogen chloride. And, and this is a free radical scavenger, which means that it it, 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 it prevents or limits oxidation flame reactions in the flame zone above it. And so instead of all the carbon being burnt to in the carbon gases being burnt to completion, um, you get a high yield of partial combustion, which is the carbon monoxide. So that's why we get such a high yield of CO from PVC itself. Okay? But if you burn something like um, wood, 
in a, in a well-ventilated condition, all the carbon goes to carbon dioxide. If you burn the wood and in, next to a piece of PVC so that the products mix in the flame, then the CO yield from the wood is increased by the hydrogen chloride in, in the flame from that wood. Are you with me? So in this context, what would happen would depend on where, where we are in the system. Right? So imagine you've got some polyethylene, the LDPE. I've said that's burning under well-ventilated conditions on the exterior. That means that most of the products that are finding their way into the flat, as I've described, and mixing with the flames and smoke from the PVC, have already gone, more or less, to completion, CO2. So I wouldn't necessarily expect them to be changed very much. But if you had another material which had not been fully burned and had been under ventilated combustion, so you've got unpartially burned gases coming in through the window, mixing with the flame from the PVC, then the yield of CO and cyanide from those materials would then be increased by the presence of the PVC. Now, to quantify that is quite challenging, but the mm. phenomenon would be there, yeah. Um, could we look, please, at page 72 of your um, report? And I just draw um, your attention first to paragraph 245 at the bottom, um, where you say, with regard to smoke and fire penetration into individual flats, the two-bedroom flats were most vulnerable because the aggregate areas of the windows and of the cladding and insulation outside them was greater than for single flats. If we um, go and look at uh, paragraph 242, uh, what you say there is that from witness accounts, although some smoke was reported as entering the flats from outside the windows, the main source of smoke entering the flats before the fire reached the flats from outside oh, was yeah. likely to have been the lobbies. The lobbies, yes. So what you have is, is um, a statement that flat, a two-bedroom flat is more vulnerable because it's got a greater area exposed to the outside. Yeah. But uh, at paragraph 242, uh, uh, a statement that certainly until yeah. the fire reaches I don't reaches think there's a, a contradiction there at all. Can I explain? Well, yeah. could you explain why yeah, you don't so, think that? So in the one case, we're talking about the vulnerability to exterior fire penetration. And in fact, I think the, the two bedroom flats are even more vulnerable because of their corner situation. If you have a fire breaking in through one corner, I think somebody described this, you can then break out through the mm. next corner. You've then got two openings and that's, that's a nice condition, if you like, mm. to develop a, quite a big fire in that flat. Whereas the one-bedroom flats are somewhat more protected, which may partly explain the slower fire growth in flat 201, which is a one-bedroom flat, mm. for example. So this is all to do with the fire breaking in from outside. But this other aspect yeah. is of smoke penetration, is smoke penetration from the inside, from the lobby. And there, um, in fact, you could argue in that situation, because they all only have one front door, that with respect to smoke penetration from the lobby, slow smoke infiltration from the lobby, the one-bedroom flat, because the volume is less, would actually be more vulnerable in that context than a two-bedroom flat, because you're dispersing the same amount of smoke and gases into a smaller or larger volume. But they're talking about two totally different things. One is smoke coming from the lobby, one is fire and smoke coming from the outside. Thank you. Um, have you, for the purpose of, your, of this phase one report, considered the potential impact of the smoke ventilation system uh, to the passage of smoke around the building on the night? Yes, only in very general terms. So, um, I've, as I've said, uh, there are a number of ways in which smoke could be spread around the building. Now, having read the witness statements, at the moment I'm coming to the view that the main source of the early dense smoke in the lobbies was via basically flat six on each floor at about 1.30. Sorry, I've forgotten what the question was. It was about the, um, the, the potential impact of the smoke ventilation system ah, yes. to the passage okay. of smoke so that's, around. That's, that's flo so that's kind of horizontal smoke, all right? But um, the question, there is this question of whether uh, if you had smoke filling one lobby on one floor, could any of that get up to a lobby on another floor? And the answer is, of course, yes, and that there are various routes by which that might happen. 
through gaps and penetrations and uh, missing seals and, and things like that. There's also the lift shaft. And um, I noted that, uh, this is at the very early stages of the fire, some people mentioned seeing smoke emerging from the lift area on, I think it was the 23rd floor, very high up. And another person talked about smoke emerging from the utility cupboard on the landing that was built as part of the renovation. Which would impl I think there's a lot of pipes going vertically through there. So that would imply there's some migration through there. There's also the question, which is still somewhat unresolved, about how exactly the smoke ventilation was performing and what it was doing on the night of the fire. I know Dr. Lane is trying to look into that in some detail. And, and indeed, I did read an account from somebody that suggested they thought they saw some smoke coming mm. from one of those grills. Um, so there are a number of routes for vertical spread. But, oh, and of course, the stair shaft is the most obvious one. Now, from my analysis of what I've seen so far, in every case I've read of anybody trying to escape, they've always said, the smoke in the lobby was far worse than the smoke in the stair. Which means that I don't believe the vertical migration of smoke up the stair was a cause of smoke in a lobby anywhere. Mm. I think it's the other way. Although some of the smoke in the stair, a lot of it, most of it I think is coming from lobbies as people open doors and things, but some of it's undoubtedly coming from down below where the firefighting and things are going on. That's another issue. Is this um, question, the, the, the potential contribution of the smoke ventilation system, something that you want to give further consideration to for your phase two report? Well, I would, I, I would like to. I don't know how far we're going to get with that, but it's obviously a consideration, yes. And don't forget that that was only designed to clear smoke from one floor. So that the operation, as I understand it from Dr. Lane's report, uh, 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 is, that, is that it was designed... Uh, to be triggered by smoke on a, on a certain floor, which, is, which should have been where, the first fire, where a fire was, and then the dampers are supposed to shut on all the other floors, mm -hmm. and then, then that smoke is extracted. And there is a bit of an indication that some of those lower floors don't look as smoke-stained as others, but I don't think we quite know what, what's ha happened there. But one thing I did on my second visit to the tower was to look closely at the smoke deposits with P Professor Steck in the um, ventilation and, and in the shafts of those uh, louvres on the various floors. We're trying to try and get some. We're, so we are looking into this a bit, but how far we'll get, I don't know. But um, whatever the outcome of that, you can consider that in your, in your phase two report. Yes, if we right? find anything out. Yeah. Uh, can I take you to page eight of your statement, please? In paragraph 21. Um, what you've done here is to um, set out what, what, what might be described as a, 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 as a, a sort of model of, uh, of oh, yeah. events of the night, and you, um, and you've just, you identify three stages. Um, and for your second stage, which is at the bottom there, at E, you, you give that a time period of 1.27 to at the outside 2 a.m. Do you see that? Yes, it's the dense smoke filling the lobbies, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And what you're, you're identifying, and you, it's, we see it there, that, that the main source of smoke entering the lobbies at this time was from flat six on each floor. That's my current feeling, but... You know, well, yeah. what's, what's the sort of evidential basis for that current feeling? Because, because uh, I was, I've looked quite closely <coughs> at what people said they did in flat six. And how they describe the conditions. And basically they're saying, fire came in, I ran around, left the flat in a hurry, in some cases leaving the door open. Um, I, know, I, I can't remember the names offhand now, but there was, one, there was some quite graphic descriptions of this. One person left, went down a few floors, and then came back up again and went back to his flat and noticed how having left his door open, he found that there was a lot more smoke in the lobby. Other people from other flats looked towards the open door of flat six when people came out and saw the plume of smoke coming out and filling, filling the lobbies. Mm -hmm. So there are quite a lot of descriptions like that. For, uh, and there were other floors where, lower down, where people deliberately left the doors open for the firefighters to uh, 
go into the flats and deal with them, but these doors were open for some period of time. Mm. Other people, we don't know what they did. Um, so that, that's based on that kind of evidence, yeah. Um, I, I want to put now put to you a proposition, and it's, it's that during that second stage that you've identified, uh, that there were internal fires in flats. Yes. Uh, and to do that, I need to show you uh, a number of pieces of evidence. Um, yeah. And the first is, is from Dr. Lane's um, initial report. We have BLAR 702, page 19, please. Uh, and we see there a, a photograph. Yes. Um, it's timed at 1.36. Uh, and we can see that there are a, a number of lit flats. Yes, yeah. Um, would that or support a, 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 a conclusion that, that there were developed internal fires at, that, at this time between floors 12 and 15? Yeah, I mean, just to sort of clarify, I, I'm basically identifying a period during which these lobbies are filling with smoke. Now, this is a bit of a continuous process, so it's hard... It's varying in different places, you know, it's hard to get hard numbers in, but it's mostly around about 0130 that these lobbies are filling with smoke. Right? Um, then, around about 2 o'clock-ish, I'm suggesting that we're now moving to a regime where we may have internal fires. Now, this particular picture here is the fire is, main fires are on the east face, which we can't see. We're seeing the fire coming around the corner onto the north face of the building. And, and so this is the, this brightness here, I believe, is mostly the burning cladding and insulation from the coming around the corner, as it were, as the fire spreads. But I don't see any evidence that there are fires in any of these flats. These look like just ordinary neon lights, so I don't see any fires in there. Well, can I show you the, um, the second piece uh, of um, evidence? Like and this is timed at 0136, so this is sort of after or towards, after the period when I'm saying the lobbies were filled with smoke, really. Yeah. Um, or towards the very end of it. Could we have um, LSBS six zeros or I think it's seven zeros, one, two, five, four, please? <coughs> Sorry, six zeros, one. And then page 254, that's it. If you go um, to the bottom there, uh, we start at paragraph 1182. It's, um, oh, yes. it, what it is, this is a... a so this is one of the witnesses a, in yeah, the flat well, six, uh, I think. If we yeah. take it in stages, mm -hmm. the first thing I need to explain is this is a, a, an extract from yeah. uh, Professor Bisbee's report. Yeah. And what he's done in this part of, and this is his supplementary report, he's summarised uh, evidence from a number of... Um, BSR witnesses. Yes. So the first person we see is Jose Vieiro, yeah. flat 46, yeah. stated the first thing I saw burning was the extractor. If we go to the next page, please. I think he may have been the man whose curtains caught fire, but I can't be sure. Yeah. Hmm. That's the one it put the Yes, it is. On yeah. fire. He yeah. states flames came through the fan yes. holes where the fan was. Uh, it gave in. It was hanging by the electric wire that supported it. Um, yes, I mentioned. I mentioned him earlier. I mentioned this phenomenon earlier. So you're, you're earlier. familiar with, with yes, his evidence. Yeah, well, yeah. if we look at the others, um, Professor, perhaps if I try and take it shortly, if I um, summarise the evidence, if you're f if you're not familiar with it and you want to read it, let me know. But if we look at the whole page, please. What this is, in effect, is summaries of evidence from people who were in flat sixes. So yeah. you have, after um, Mr. Vieiro, um, resident in flat 56, mm. uh, then you have flat 66 at paragraph 1184, which we know is, um, I think, Mrs. Wahabi, who gave evidence uh, some time ago. You then have flat 76, then flat 86, um, and the person who um, gave evidence for flat 86 is referred to in paragraph 1187, which is Nadia Jafari. Yeah. And then at the bottom, you then go to flat 146 and then flat 186. Yeah. Now, I think you... I understand what you You focused mm -hmm. in, in the yeah. work you've done so far. You have paid attention to evidence Yes, in fact, I've created six, a table which is in my draft, longer draft report, which summarises all the witnesses for every flat 
six, as far as I can, and I'm paying particular attention in that section of my longer report to how they, what they observed about the, work, the penetration of fire and its development in their flats. And what I found with that, I, th I mentioned it earlier, I, I did actually have originally a slide with these names on in various categories, but what you find is that some, as I said this morning, some people um, had smoke coming in first without, before the fire came into their flats, uh, more, than, more than saw flames. So with more people said their first experience was this flat filling with smoke. Other people found the fire coming through the ventilator, as described here. Other people said they had a window open and flames and smoke came through. And two people, I, I recollect, said that they had glazing failure very rapidly after the fire first appeared outside the window. But of course all these are still exterior and structural fires outside and around and involving the window with the two exceptions which I did mention earlier where this is one of them, the arrow is one of them where there were some curtains that caught fire which he then stamped on I think and put out and somebody else as I said earlier had a curtain between the kitchen window and the double doors leading to the lounge and that curtain caught fire. So there's a variety, but other people are only mentioning smoke at that stage. Mm. It, but, it, but it's not a contents fire. This is a structural fire. And, and to uh, conclude on it, there, there's nothing in the um, witness evidence that you've read in relation to a flat six that leads you to conclude that in the time period for your second stage, there was an internal flat fire. I mean, the numbers I, I think I put up, and that particular paragraph you showed me, I put up to 147. That might be getting a bit late. I mean, and it also depends on the height in the tower because it's a progression. But basically, you've still got these two sort of stages, and it's hard to, it's because there's so much variation, it's hard to sort of put a sharp time on any of these phenomena. Mm. But basically, you've got a period up to somewhere around 0135, I think I'd probably now say, where there's dense smoke building from about 0125 to 135 ish in the lobby which precedes um, any well, involvement wonder, of the contents. Is that quite right? I mean, look, looking at your paragraph 21, your first period... Uh, oh, yes, you're right. They were filling yeah. to about half past one. And yeah. your second period assumes that they were filled as from about half past one. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. But, I mean, one, once you start to get closer to two o'clock, and this is a continuous process operating, operating differently at different places, then you have the potential for these interior fires to start to develop and form mm -hmm. a greater part of the issue. And one of my slides, I think, shows that quite clearly, which was taken at about 0220 by Professor Biggs, well, one of his, in his report. Mm -hmm. And in that one, you can clearly see fires in the windows. Of some, but that's 20 past two, I think, nearer to 20 past two. Well, well can I show you um, just a final piece of evidence in relation to this point? Um, and it is, again, from uh, Professor Bisbee's report. It's from page 207, um, sorry, the, uh, of the same document. And, and, and what we have there is that's a, a photograph taken at 144, an image taken at 144. Uh, and, um, which, do you know which angle is this? Yeah. Which face? Yes. Oh, this must be it's the east face, isn't it? I think. Yes. Yeah. And, and and if you if does that help you to decide whether right. there are developed internal so fires? So this is this is 144. Now we can see this brightness here is where the fire has moved left to start to involve the sort of 201 flat the flat one column. This here is where it's moving around onto the north face and involving the uh, the other face of flat six all the way up. But these brightness here do look as if they could well be internal fires. And he says, well, there may be more of them lower down, as you might expect, because that's affected first. So there could be some internal fires here, although some other shots I've shown, don't, I showed on my presentation, don't seem to really show that. But these do look like internal fires, yes. So time. taking that time period... But this is long after 0130. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but your, your time period ends at 2 o'clock for your second stage. Oh, I mean, to be fair to you, you give it as 1.45, 2 o'clock. Yeah, I mean, it's all a bit... Mm. Yeah. Um, but, but, but by that time, I'm, I'm expecting to start to see 
Interior forests, yes. So w would a fair summary be that t towards the end of your second stage is when you would expect to see internal fires? Possibly, but I mean, this needs a lot more work, really. I mean, I th I'm looking forward to uh, collaborating or looking more deeply into the time, the exterior time shots from the other experts combined with the observations of people who are in these flats to try and pin down some of these aspects. Although I don't, I don't recall much description in the witness statements of large burning furniture fires in flats. Mm. Uh, so. Um, and just before we leave, I mean, as we've shown in, in paragraph um, 21 of your report where you identified these three stages, um, are the time range that you've given based on your consideration of witness evidence? Is, yes. is that, that's the, the, the source, source of it? Yeah. I thought. Um, can I just uh, take you back to flat six? Um, yes. And we can just, if we can go take that image off and, and go back to um, Professor's report. But have you conducted an analysis thus far of whether the doors to each flat six had a closer, mm. um, when the flat six was vacated, and whether the door was left open? Or is mm. this something that you may consider undertaking mm. for phase mm. two? I haven't done a systematic study. Uh, I'm not sure it would be my place to do that. But, of course, I am extremely interested in the timing and extent of any s smoke migration and cause of it through these doors. One of the complications, of course, is we've got lots of... Two or three, um, Dr Lane's given a breakdown of the different types of doors that were in all the different flats, the numbers that there were. So there's a variety mm. there. Um, so far, what I've done is to look at the, the witness statements and without you know, uh, categorizing exactly, I've come across a lot of well, the witnesses were asked this question and many of them said, uh, some of them said they'd had to remove the self-closers mechanism. Some of them said oh, we had them but they didn't really work. And including quite a few of them escaping from flat six said you had to physically close the door if you wanted it to make sure it closed. You had to make sure you did it. Uh, and uh, so where people fled and left the door open, and some of them then went back and confirmed this, there was smoke coming out, seemed to be coming, weren't, they weren't necessarily shutting properly. I'm not sure they didn't, but some of them may have done, I don't know. But there's a variety of things going on there, and a variety of door types. I'm not, at the moment, planning myself to do a systematic sort of study, but I'm very interested in this kind of information. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can I move on just as... Um a different topic, and that is just uh, about uh, the differences or similarities between hydrogen cyanide and carbon monoxide. Yes, I'm sorry, I had two more slides on this morning, which I cut out for time reasons. Yeah. Um, um, what what you've said, it, uh, I mean, firstly, is it right that hydrogen chlor uh, cyanide would be more potent than carbon monoxide? Yes. But what you've also said in your report um, is that they're additive in combination. Okay? Yes. That's based on experimental. Can you explain how that works, given that hydrogen cyanide is more potent than carbon monoxide? Oh, yeah, because we do it in terms of the FED. So if you've got, if you've got an atmosphere and you expose an animal to it, in fact, with half the concentration of cyanide that would cause incapacitation in a certain time, um, and that alone, then after that sort of time, they're not going to be incapacitated. If in the same mixture you put half an incapacitating dose of carbon monoxide, which would be a much greater amount, but half the amount required, half plus a half equals one, they tend to become incapacitated in that additive way. Mm. It's a fairly rough estimate, but that's the, that's the way we've we treated it, and that seems to be the, the case. Uh, and again, uh, d does hydrogen cyanide have a more rapid effect than carbon monoxide? Yes, and, and as I said this morning, I really see cyanide much more in terms of incapacitating effects than death. I think in most cases, there are cases where cyanide fires have killed people. Um, there's, there's some recent papers, fires in some prisons where the prison mattresses produced a lot of cyanide and there was not much carbon dioxide in the blood of these victims. But that's rare. Normally you find that when people are dead in a fire, they have a lethal dose of carbon dioxide in their blood, as I mentioned earlier. So if they have been exposed to cyanide, and many of them are, I feel this is more significant in terms of 
collapse before you escape rather than whether or not you die. You know? and one of the points you make in your report is that blood cyanide levels is not, are not routinely measured following yes. the fire. Do you know yeah. why that is? Yeah. No, cost, I think. I mean, basically, uh, they always measure carbon monoxide. Uh, and it's fairly straightforward to measure. It's very stable. As I said, it's a very good marker of the extent to which somebody can be explained as a smoke death. And, of course, not all fires produce cyanide. What con contrast, cyanide is very uh, unstable in blood, uh, particularly in the blood of fatality. So you can lose half of it in 24 hours in a, in a body. So if it's three days before you take the blood sample in autopsy, you've lost most of the information. And then once you've got the blood sample, whereas the CO samples are pretty stable, the cyanide will then deteriorate, will gradually be lost on storage. So, and, and also, the interpretation of what the significance of a particular cyanide level is in terms of what happened to the people is very complicated. And I, I've been developing some models to try and deal with this, which I've published, but it's, so it's not an easy thing to deal with. But it would be very valuable if we did it. There was a very particular study in France um, by a, a Professor Bode who went out with the French uh, fire service and he took blood samples from fire victims in dwellings as they were pulled out of the building. So very fresh samples. They were alive. Um, and he found very high levels of cyanide in those fresh blood samples. Whereas when they're done at post-mortem, they're often much lower. So it is, an, it is a bit of a problem. Yeah. Mm. But it would be good. I'm disappointed that it's not measured you know, because it would give us more information. Uh, in the context of, of, of the, the, the tower, um, is it at all possible that someone could have been exposed to hydrogen cyanide but not carbon monoxide? I don't know. You always have both, but of course the proportions depend on the situation. And to turn to carbon monoxide, if someone was exposed to a level of carbon monoxide sufficient to cause an increase in carboxyhemoglobin levels, yes, and that person were then able to take shelter somewhere where there was a, a lower level of carbon monoxide or where they could get air, yes. oxygen into their system, yes, would that mean that the carboxyhemoglobin level would reduce? Decrease, yes. So if you, um, for example, you came down the stair and you were breathing CO, and then you went and stood outside and breathed ordinary air, over a period of an hour or two, you'd get a decay curve, you'd, you'd, you'd flush it out. If you breathe oxygen at the same time, you flush it out much more quickly, uh, because the two things compete in the blood. Yeah. So yes is the answer to that. It gradually, it gradually lost. Yeah. And um, what about um, hydrogen cyanide? If you were able to remove yourself from a, a source of hydrogen cyanide to somewhere safer, would, would the levels of hydrogen cyanide in the blood then decrease? Uh, from, from my studies, uh, the, the level of cyanide, it does decrease, but it, it's over a, quite a long time scale. It's uh, comparable to the CO, though. Yeah. Yes, it does decrease, yes. Um, just one f uh, final matter um, before I ask for a short adjournment. But um, the one of the, you've set out in your uh, report at the end, and we, we don't need to go to it, but you've set out the further work that you're considering yes. uh, for the purpose of your phase two report. And, and that includes, doesn't it, a review of the evidence of firefighters. Is that right? Oh, yes. I haven't really had a chance to do that yet. So I've glanced at some of it, but I haven't done a systematic study. Thank you. Um, well, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I've, I've reached the end, I think, of my okay. questions, but I, right. if I could ask for a short five-minute break to see if there's anything else I need to yes. canvas with. Can I just, can I just yes. uh, briefly say something on this topic? Partly because I missed off on those slides. I'm asking myself, sorry, uh, if, if cyanide, the role cyanide may have played, or made a difference anywhere at Grenfell, and I'm talking, I've talked a bit about the cyanide and the CO coming in to flat six from the mm. outside. As I said this morning, nobody was incapacitated in a flat six. They all had time to get away. So neither CO nor cyanide played any part, had any significant effect on anybody who was in a flat six. All right? Then you've got the later phase when people are trapped in other flats and, and trying to get into the lobby. That lobby will be, have high concentrations of both CO and probably cyanide. But a lot of that cyanide will now have been, particularly after two o'clock, generated from the contents 
as much as the cladding. And then when the fire gets round to any flat and breaks in, it's a bit like the original flat six situation. So the only situation I can see where the presence of cyanide may have affected the outcome for people at Grenfell. If you're trapped in the flat and die there, it doesn't make any difference. Where it just could conceivably have an influence is if you stay in a, for any flat up to, say, 3 a.m., and then you come out into the very smoke-filled lobby and the smoke-filled stair, and which will contain high concentrations of cyanide. And if your flat is on fire and that's got some cyanide in, then it's conceivable that whether or not you make it to the bottom of the stair or not, or collapse in the stair, might partially be affected by cyanide. But the source of that cyanide that you're breathing in the lobby and stair is going to be mainly from the con burning contents that's getting into the lobbies. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, yeah. we'll have a short break now so that uh, Council can consider whether there are any further questions. Further questions. Exactly. So uh, I'm going to say quarter past four. Um, and same as before, no talking about your evidence, please, yes. while you're out of the room. And uh, get, if you go to the usher, she'll look after you. You, you could leave all those there if you'd like to, because well, yeah, you'll be back. I think I'll soon. be all right. Yeah. I'll, I'll I just think that'll be quite safe, don't worry. It's just whether I need to look anything up, but I think it's all right. Okay, I'll leave it there. Yeah, come to you. Thank so. you. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Right, uh, 4.15, please.
Oh, right. Thank you, Professor. Well, I, I gather there's one matter that Council needs to raise. Okay. Um, yes, Mr. Lowell. Thank you, sir. Um, Professor Purser, can I ask you this? Um, you've, in both your report and in the evidence you've given today, you've explained that in terms of, of um, the toxic matters that you're concerned with, it's first there's smoke as a toxic product. Then you've spoken about asphyxiant gases. And then you've also spoken about the... Uh, irritant acidic gases. Um, so th th those in terms of, of, of products were, were what somebody in, in the tower risked being exposed to. Sorry, it's very noisy over here. Yeah, okay. carry on. If um, a person, either in a flat or making their way through a lobby or down the stairs, used a face covering, a, a towel over the mouth, would that uh, um, offer any protection against the uh, toxins that you've spoken of? Yes, it would, and, and of course many people did do this. So the main, the main barriers to progress initially down through the lobbies and down the stair are obviously the optical effects, mm. which you can't deal with, um, and the irritancy. And so it's the pain to the eyes, the pain to the nose and the mouth, and the difficulty in breathing. And this is partly due to the smoke particles themselves, and as I mentioned this morning, to the organic irritants and acid gases attached to these mm. particles, which get down into the airways and cause distress, and partly due to the free gases, acid gases that you're breathing. By having a towel or a wet towel, um, you can filter those. You can't stop the asphyxiant gases, though. Certainly there's carbon monoxide by that method, but you can get some relief from the irritants. And people did. And what's the benefit of the towel being wet? Well, it's mainly, whether it's wet or dry, it's a filter. But I think if it's wet, certainly if it's wet, it will absorb the acid gases like hydrogen chloride to some extent. Um, it's just slightly better filter, but it's wet or dry. Anything would help, yeah. Thank you. That's all I have. Can I thank you, Professor, for coming and giving your evidence you. today? Mm. Well, Professor, thank you very much indeed. Could, you've given a lot of time and effort to the investigation of this tragedy, and um, you've put your undoubted expertise at our disposal, for which we are, are very grateful indeed. Thank you. Thank, thank you me. very much, and thank you for coming along today to give us your evidence and, uh, and explain what it's all about. Good. Well, now, if you'd like to go with the usher, that, that's... Yes. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Robert. Uh, so, before we uh, finish for the day, there's one short matter that I, I need yes. to deal with. Could I please have on the screen uh, I and Q... Five zero five three four, please. Um, if I could explain that um, this is a schedule which has already been disclosed to all core participants, mm -hmm. uh, and it lists uh, witness evidence of uh, firefighters, senior fire officers, firefighters, and control room operators, um, and uh, we would ask that. Um, the statements listed there are taken as read into the record today. Um, the statements themselves uh, will be published at some point on the inquiry website, and everyone has been notified of uh, the plan. Yes. Well, thank you very much. I think it's right that we record our gratitude to all those who've made statements. Uh, even if they haven't been called as witnesses in person, their evidence is very valuable, and the statements will form part of the overall evidence before the inquiry and will, will be taken into account accordingly. Thank very you. good. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. So that's all for today. It is. Now, we're not sitting tomorrow. No. But we are sitting on Monday. We're sitting on Monday just to deal with um, some um, evidence from the bereaved residents and survivors. Yes. Which is going to be read and ed admitted evidence. Right. Thank you very much. So uh, we will... Uh, obviously a break now and we'll resume at 10 o'clock on Monday morning. So thank you very much. <laughs>